Okay, now, I did all of that because I feel like a Bible study that we take serious, the text, needed those few minutes, okay? Um, I could have just said, earliest Greek manuscript is not there. It's in a bunch of the other ones. I believe it's true. Let's move on. And I don't, there wouldn't have been nothing wrong with that, I guess, but it wouldn't have satisfied me because I feel like you're worth more than that as students and I'm worth more than that as a teacher and the word seems to be worth more than that for all of us. Now you make your own judgment call about how you feel about it. How I treat this story is it's an incredible snapshot between yet another confrontation between the Pharisees and Jesus. A trap's been laid for Jesus, which seems to fit the narrative of all of the stories of confrontation between the Pharisees and Jesus. Jesus responds in the same manner that he does in all of the other stories, with one glaring exception, which we'll talk about, that this story brings out. And the end result is so Pauline in its theology. It's so first-generation church in the neither do I condemn thee, that it's the most foreshadowing story in the life and ministry of Jesus. That we don't see the early church feeding 5,000 people with bread and fish, but we do see them meeting people with the message of no condemnation. And so more, more theology is pulled from this story that is new covenant theology than maybe any other story we encounter in the Gospels. With all of that said, it's always been one of my favorites. This moment of Jesus being confronted at basically the early morning. He's been up talking to his father. He's confronted as he's been teaching people in the, in the edge of the temple or, or near the base of the Mount of Olives. A woman caught in the act of adultery is brought to Jesus. He does not give an immediate response. He reaches down and doodles in the dirt. I've heard 50 interpretations of what that's all about. Before finally this confrontation of what do you think we ought to do with this woman? The law of Moses says well, we should stone her. And Jesus' response as he disarms the accusers and then relieves her from condemnation. So precious, so beautiful that in my early days of understanding the revelation of grace, this was one of the stories that I was drawn to by the Holy Spirit to go back to and to go back to and to go back to. And if I have no other reason, I'm capping all, I'm, I'm promise we're going to get into the text, I'm capping all of this off with this statement. If for no other reason I believe this story, it is that I've learned the voice of the Spirit and over and over He brought me back to this story to relieve me of condemnation and to show me the heart of the Father through the face of His Son. And that's good enough for me. And so, proof, I don't have. Experience, I have. And I think before next week is out, because next week we'll really break down what happens when Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. That's the end of the story. We're going to get you to the end of the story tonight. And then we'll take it to Paul. But you'll see, I think, before we're finished, the necessity of this story and understanding the real theology of the new covenant. Let's read it. John 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Ugh. What a terrible way to start a chapter. Now seems like a perfect opening to a chapter, doesn't it? Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. So typical of Jesus. Three. Then the scribes and Pharisees, there's that interesting and token usage, by the way, the book of John of the scribes. Scribes are simply what it sounds like. They are people scribe, with scribal authority. Um, some, of the, some of the very, 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 very slim minority of people who could both read and write in the ancient world. One scholar put that number at less than 3% of adults on the planet at the time of Christ could read and write. Uh, some people have tried to use John 8, by the way, so, here's an aside. Some people try to use John 8 as proof that Jesus knew how to write. I think that is completely missing the point of the doodle. But that G Jesus' doodling was to prove to you that he was also a scribe. Okay, I just throw that out there. I don't believe that, but you can do what you want with it. Um, the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, in other words, they bring her right into the middle of this little teaching session that Jesus has going. 
They said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And that leads us to really wonder what she looks like and how they found her. And I'll give you some theories on that in a moment. And this always surfaces the, of course, famous question of where's the guy. And I, I don't know that we can really solve that, but we'll try in just a minute. Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law. And it's fitting they go back to Moses because that's what they have. Remember, they're Torah people. And so Moses is, sits in the judgment seat. Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? I wanted to show you that so that you would know that they're authentic. Leviticus 20 says this. The man, 20 and 10. The man who commits adultery, this is from the law. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife. He who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife. And here's the, here's the kicker. Both the adulterer and the adulteress, both the man and the woman, shall surely be put to death. It's pretty cut and dry. I mean, it's pretty plain. The law is not ambiguous at all. In fact, Deuteronomy, what takes Leviticus one verse to do, takes Deuteronomy three or four long verses to do, really spells it out all the way down to how you're to stone them. Um, and it makes it very explicit. Very, there's no, it's not just an implied judgment. It makes a very explicit judgment with both the man and the woman caught in the act of adultery are to be brought outside and stoned. I gave you the Leviticus version, not because it's better, but just because it's shorter and just kind of compact. All right, back to the story. John 8, 6 to 11, this they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. I'm reading this straight through. Um, and then we're going to talk about it. All right. If you're wondering, why are we skipping all this stuff? Because I stood there for 20 minutes and talked about this story and didn't read it. So I thought you'd want to see it. Uh, as if you don't know it. Seven. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, who, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Eight. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. This is interesting because it's twice that Jesus stoops down and writes on the ground. Nine. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Let's stop here for a minute. I know we got more verses, but we'll get to them in a second. Um, I'll conclude it in a second. I, I want to try to deal with some of this, some of the questions that surface as we go through this story. The argument that is brought most of the time in telling this story is that the Pharisees are bringing the woman without the man. Where's the man? An argument I never heard in my life, but surfaced, I don't know, in the last few years, maybe I just wasn't studying the right commentators, um, has tried to assert that maybe the man is one of them. Um, I personally think that's us reading more malevolence into the scribes and Pharisees than they had. We need to understand something about the Pharisees. These are not guys who are covering up wicked lives with religion so you'll like them. They are the ultimate example of righteousness by works. If you ask the average man on the street in the first century, who are the holiest people in the world? They would have said the Pharisees, maybe the scribes, maybe the, Sa the Sadducees. We're not talking about a group of people running around nefarious faces. We've watched too many plays and movies that are covering up sin and trying to corner Jesus. They believed that they were the closest thing to righteousness. What frustrates the Pharisees in the time of Christ about Christ is that he preaches a God of love, but he does not preach a God of love and strict obedience to the law. And that bothers them. Jesus is not preaching lax obedience to the law. He just doesn't bother to preach obedience to the law at all. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus brings up the law over and over and over again. And when he brings it up, it seems elevated past the spot where anybody can keep it. And that's merely because once Jesus does start to talk about the law as a mode of obedience, his point is you can't keep it even though you think you can. Watch how hard it would be. Remember that famous adultery one? Oh, you haven't committed adultery. I say to you, if you look on a woman lust after in her heart, you've already committed adultery. What's Jesus saying? You're, it's bigger than you think it is, and it's harder than you think it is. And even when you think you're keeping it, you're probably not keeping it. That was his point. That's not justification for not running around teaching it. It's just merely that when Jesus does open his mouth about the law, he puts it at such a level that it's impossible for man to be able to keep it. And therefore, grace is going to be that thing that 
It's not just that thing, but grace will be that which will take us into the realm of, of who we are intended to be righteous, righteousness, not because of our works. So the Pharisees are frustrated with Jesus. He's not a bad guy. They call him teacher. He's doing amazing things. He's healing the sick and he's feeding the hungry and, and, and people like him and people are drawn to him. And yet his version of how he interprets the scripture and how he loves and, and how he teaches or doesn't teach strict obedience to the law is frustrating to the Pharisees. So they, just, they devise a test. We bring to him a blatant breaking of Moses' law. And it needs to be a big one. And what's bigger than catching someone in the very act of adultery? I mean, what do you have to go through to do that? To, to catch somebody in the very act of adultery. And so to bring this woman to Jesus, there's really nowhere for him to go. We finally cornered him. This isn't some ambiguous statement about whether or not his disciples wash their hands over corn or whether or not you should lift your neighbor's donkey out of a ditch on the Sabbath or maybe he should or shouldn't have healed that guy one day and told him to take up his bed. This is a biggie. This is life or death. This is one of the big ten in the commandments. We, we've got him trapped. There's nowhere for him to go. And I don't know, I can't tell you why they don't bring the man. My theory on why they don't bring the man, repeating, my theory, not fact, didn't hear this from the Holy Spirit. My theory of why they didn't bring the man is a couple things. One, they didn't care. They weren't trying to actually get anybody caught in adultery. They were trying to catch Jesus. This incident is not about catching the woman. It's about catching Christ. They just needed bait. And that's all the woman is, which might have a real deep psychology to it because a lot of times people are just bait for something else very nefarious and wicked and wrong. The second reason I don't think they brought the man is because I kind of think that she's probably a prostitute. That's how they caught her in the act of adultery. And, in, and as much as we don't like this and as, and as much as we don't talk about it, the reflection in the Old Testament on a man sleeping with a prostitute was different than a man cheating on his wife. And I've never liked it. And who does? I mean, watch Judah sleep with Tamar in Genesis. He thinks she's a prostitute. Nobody judges him for it. He comes back to town later and goes, hey, I brought payment for that prostitute. Where is she? He doesn't even hide it. I brought payment for the prostitute. You guys got the prostitute? They go, we don't have a prostitute in this town. He goes, oh, well, that's weird. <laughs> right, right. So I don't know who I slept with, but... All right, well, see you later. And that's literally what happens. He leaves. He's just like, well, okay, I don't know. I don't know. Whoever she was, she got my bracelet and my staff, and she's got my stuff, but, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> and then his daughter-in-law, Tamar, turns up pregnant a few months later, and he's mad, ready to kill her. And he goes, who's the dad? <laughs> and she goes, whoever owns this. And, uh-oh, that's my bracelet, and um, I'm the guy. And it's a bad story with a terrible, and it actually, that baby ends up in the genealogy of Christ, which is a mind blower. Not, I don't, I don't walk away from that story going, God doesn't care if you sleep with a prostitute. No, but the people in that culture didn't seem to view it in the same way they did adultery. So in my opinion, once again, my opinion, they went and found a prostitute because she's easy to catch in the act. They know where she is, who she is. They don't need the guy. They need bait. They need somebody to throw at the feet of Jesus. 